welcome back to Duke's Copy TV. Today I'm joined in the studio by Bob Pillar, Director at Opera Consult and also Lecturer at Geneva School of Business. And today we're talking trading companies. Bob, thank you so much for coming in. And well, thank you for having me. Now, firstly, can you tell us, have trading companies come into the public eye a little bit more due to recent events? Definitely. They've, uh, for, for years, for decades, they've been rather quiet, they're rather quiet creatures, but with the Glencore, and of course Glencore is the most, uh, probably the best known commodity trading name, they went public last year in one of the biggest IPOs in, in Europe. Uh, and uh, so that has heightened the awareness of trading companies and, and that they exist and what they do, and I think uh, has spurred other trading companies perhaps to uh, be a bit more um, forthcoming and you see them more in the news, you see them more uh, uh, at, at conferences. Uh, there was a big commodities conference in Lausanne where some of the uh, heads of the trading companies were speaking there, and that was quite unusual. You don't typically see that. So yes, I think there has been, uh, been a, a, a trend in that way. And do you think that it's made people think of, of trading companies a little bit differently? Uh, well, I think uh, that's a good, a good question because uh, many people don't understand trading companies, even financial analysts. Uh, have a difficult time because the classic trading company uh, is about being an intermediary, about buying from producers and selling to consumers. Uh, typically, again, over the past uh, decades, uh, a, a big element of that was actually uh, you, you know, in the commodities world. Uh, there is a great imbalance in where commodities are produced and where they're needed. Uh, so that's what trading companies do, is they try to smooth the imbalance, and that's what they would tell you what, what they do. Um, because of this more intermediary quantity, role, um, you know, buying and selling, typically uh, trading companies are characterized by not having much in terms of fixed assets. That's more about working capital, receivables, inventory. Uh, analysts love things with fixed assets or un to understand the business. So it's not it actually an easy business to really understand. It's not so transparent. Okay, so do you think there's been a big change in this sector and indeed in trading companies over the last few years? Absolutely, uh, and, and it's an evolution that's happening now, probably started a, a couple of years ago. The big theme for trading companies, and we get, we're you know, especially talking about the, the top tier uh, trading companies, and, and perhaps maybe even you know, the second tier in, in general, is a, a move towards uh, vertical integration. And that's actually getting away from the classic intermediary role, uh, the pure buy buying and selling, uh, and this is a, a change uh, which is uh, probably the, a second generation change. It was an original change where uh, trading companies, perhaps uh, 20 or maybe even longer, 30 years ago, uh, what they were able to live on was the fact that they would have uh, offices around the world. It was very much, of course, uh, you know, we didn't have the internet and didn't have uh, you know, uh, mobile phones and all these things. And uh, uh, having physical presence in a number of markets uh, around the world gave them a better information uh, uh, flow. Uh, and they could trade off of that. Um, that changed with um, you know, the coming of uh, trading screens. Now, you know, someone uh, sitting on the border of Zimbabwe and Zambia by uh, you know, Victoria Falls can instantly know the price of copper today. So that sort of informational uh, advantage is gone. That's when uh, you know, trading companies, uh, perhaps in the 80s and 90s, uh, were, were very much then in increasingly becoming involved in emerging market risk. So it was become very much a, uh, a, a, one of the things that they were doing was really being a, a player or, or a taker of country risk, um, again with the sourcing of commodities from, from emerging markets. Do you think they want to be seen differently now in the, in the eyes of the public? And do you think that a lot of companies now will co come forward and want to be seen a lot more? Uh, Tell you the truth, doubtful. I, I tend to think that uh, the Glencore case uh, uh, was, and, and talking about uh, trading companies based in the West, based in Europe, uh, was is is perhaps going to be a bit of a anomaly. And they had particular reasons for doing it. Uh, uh, one reason for the IPO was certainly to help the shareholders, which is a partnership, um, have a way to to uh, have, you know, be able to trade their shares to to. Um, 
uh, give a market value to their shares and have a, a way of ultimately cashing out. Uh, the other one was uh, their strategy, their goal, which um, is still in the works, but it looks like it's going to happen, was uh, uh, to merge with Extrata, the mining company. And so uh, apparently one of the things they felt they had to do was to be publicly quoted themselves because Extrata was publicly quoted. So it was questions of valuation there and, and how to make the merger work. So I think there were some very specific reasons they did. Uh, other trading companies would say that um, being private, uh, because you know, many of the opportunities in trading are, uh, you know, there's, no, there's no way of, of patenting an idea or of protecting, copywriting anything you do. You try to find find the, uh, you know, the places where you can make a bit of extra money. Perhaps there's an arbitrage somewhere, and uh, oftentimes these will then disappear very quickly. Uh, so trading companies tend to be discreet. They tend not to like to talk to the public, actually, which is why you know, what Glencore did was so unusual. And I actually I don't think there is going to be a big following um, in that way. I see. Bob, thank you so much for coming in and sharing your insights with us. But just lastly, before you go, we have to ask you the Dukas coffee question. <laughs> so we ask everyone that comes into the studio, if you had one million US dollars to invest in the market for just one year, where would you put it and why? And these are your options. Well, um, uh, I see that your studio's turned red, which is not uh, boding well, so one goes into the red. I might put it in gold. Uh, it's it's volatile, but um, and maybe the reason I would do that is if uh, the U.S. Uh, doesn't sort out the fiscal cliff and they go into recession and there's other knock-on effects, maybe gold might 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 be a good place to be. Well, Bob, thank you so much for coming into the studio and sharing your insights with us once again. Well, thank you for having me. It was my great pleasure. That's all from us here in the Dukas Copy Studio, but make sure you click back to the website for more interviews and updates.